Hi. My name is Jerome. This image best represents my struggle to shed the effects of being indoctrinated into a high-control religious group. The videos posted on this channel, as well as articles on the associated website, preachfromthehousetops.com, are the results of my personal study of the Bible. God's Word is written for each individual. We must not allow a box drawn by any person, or organization, to limit the understanding we personally can gain from it. That is the aim of this channel. If you find the information I share helpful, please like and subscribe, to get notification of future videos. A number of questions were raised by viewers in their comments about part 4 of this series, What Future for the Earth? If Revelation was fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 CE, what about Christians living today? Are we not still waiting for God's kingdom to begin its rule? What about His promise that we shall rule with Him? What about the 1,000 years spoken of in Revelation chapter 20? Has Satan been placed in an abyss already? Has all of that been fulfilled? If so, what accounts then for all the wickedness and suffering that has been ongoing even up to our day? Let's see if we can provide an answer to these questions. To begin with, although the prevailing view for some time, that the book of Revelation is dated to around 96 CE, it is not a certainty. Scholars are divided on this, with some believing it possible that it was written around 68 CE. For more on that, see the video, When Was Revelation Written? I personally believe the earlier date harmonizes better with statements within the book. However, with the possibility of John receiving the revelation prior to 70 CE, that does not have to mean that all of what is written in it, would have to be fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. We would not come to that conclusion in regard to Isaiah or Daniel, who recorded prophecies that were fulfilled long after their lifetimes. While he was with them, Jesus promised his disciples that they would rule with him. Since he received all authority, shortly after his resurrection, does that mean they began ruling at that time? Or will their rulership begin when he returns in the future? Let's address this question first. Jesus did promise that they would rule with him. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the recreation, when the Son of Man sits down on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. But when did he indicate that would take place? What did Jesus mean by in the recreation? The Net Bible renders this as, the age when all things are renewed. The study note on the verse says, The Greek term is understood as a reference to the Messianic age, the time when all things are renewed and restored, with a reference to Revelation 21 5. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea is no more. I also saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, and prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. With that, I heard a loud voice from the throne say, Look, the tent of God is with mankind, and he will reside with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them, and he will wipe out every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more, neither will mourning, nor outcry, nor pain be any more. The former things have passed away. Regarding the recreation, in his notes on the New Testament, Albert Barnes comments. This word occurs but once elsewhere in the New Testament, Titus 3 5. It literally means a new birth, or being born again. Applied to man, it denotes the great change when the heart is renewed, or when the sinner begins to be a Christian. This is its meaning 
clearly, in the passage referred to in Titus, but this meaning cannot be applied here. Christ was not born again, and in no proper sense could it be said that they had followed Him in the new birth. But the word also means any great change, or a restoration of things to a former state or to a better state. In this sense it is probably used here. It refers to that great revolution, that restoration of order in the universe, that universal new birth, which will occur when the dead shall rise, and all human things shall be changed, and a new order of things shall start up, out of the ruins of the old, when the Son of Man shall come to judgment. The passage, then, should be read, Ye which have followed me shall, as a reward in the great day of the resurrection of the dead, and of forming the new and eternal order of things, the day of judgment, the regeneration, be signally honored and blessed. Are you already satisfied? Are you already rich? Have you begun ruling as kings without us? I really wish that you had begun ruling as kings, so that we also might rule with you as kings. He pointed to 1 Corinthians 4a to show that the disciples understood this to be, not something they presently enjoyed, but something yet future for them. Or do you not know that the holy ones will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you not competent to try very trivial matters? Do you not know that we will judge angels? Then why not matters of this life? But now, what about the question of where? Will they go to heaven and rule over the earth from there? Or will they rule upon the earth? The Jews long believed in a future resurrection at the last day. Perhaps the strongest assurance of a future resurrection from the dead is found in Daniel 12 too. And many of those asleep in the dust of the earth will wake up, some to everlasting life, and others to reproach and to everlasting contempt. Martha's words to Jesus regarding the death of her brother Lazarus shows that this was the understanding of Jews even in the first century. However, their belief did not include a hope of going to heaven. Martha was looking forward to seeing her brother again, and perhaps other faithful ones from the past, in the future on earth. What she didn't realize was that Jesus, as the Messiah, intended to accomplish that right then. So, if Jesus were later to introduce to his disciples the hope of life in heaven with God, we would expect to find some evidence of confusion among them at first, until they gradually came to understand this new teaching. A very revealing account in this regard is found in John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Exercise faith in God. Exercise faith also in me. In the house of my Father are many dwelling places. Otherwise, I would have told you, for I am going my way to prepare a place for you. Also, if I go my way and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and will receive you home to myself, so that where I am, you also may be. And where I am going, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? From this it appears that Jesus is teaching them something new. Thomas clearly shows that he had trouble understanding what Jesus meant. So we would be inclined to take this as proof that Jesus is going to prepare a place in heaven, and will return to take his disciples to be with him there. But is that the case? A very important element in understanding the meaning of statements in the Bible is to first think of how people living at the time, would understand the expressions. We need to be careful to avoid concluding that a statement made in the first century, would automatically mean the same today. How would the disciples have understood what Jesus meant when he said, in the house of my father? The Greek word rendered, house, often refers to the place where one lives. And as seen in the Lord's Prayer it is clear that God dwells in heaven. I think we can safely say that, as difficult as it was for the Jews to grasp, Jesus did speak of himself having come from heaven and that he would return there. This is made clear on another occasion recorded in John chapter 8. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will look for me, and yet you will die in your sin. 
Where I am going, you cannot come. The Jews then began to say, He will not kill himself, will he? Because he says, Where I am going, you cannot come. He went on to say to them, You are from the realms below, I am from the realms above. You are from this world, I am not from this world. Earlier in chapter 13, Jesus reminds his disciples of this discussion. Little children, I am with you a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I said to the Jews, Where I go, you cannot come. I now say it also to you. This time it is Peter that is confused. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Later in chapter 17, it is very interesting what Jesus prays for in behalf of his disciples. Father, I want those whom you have given me to be with me where I am, in order that they may look upon my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the founding of the world. The context shows that he was praying to receive the glory he had alongside his Father before the world was. It is therefore plain that his wish was for them to be with him in heaven. The Greek word rendered, place or dwelling, occurs only twice in the Bible, here in John 14 3 and in verse 23. But it is important to balance what he says in verse 3 with what he promises in verse 23. Let's compare the two verses. Also, if I go my way and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and will receive you home to myself, so that where I am, you also may be. If anyone loves me, he will observe my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. F. F. Bruce, in his commentary on the Gospel of John, notes that this idea of Jesus coming to them, but also bringing them to be with him, bears remarkable similarity to his promise to the congregation in Laodicea. Look, I am standing at the door and knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into his house and take the evening meal with him, and he with me. To the one who conquers, I will grant to sit down with me on my throne, just as I conquered, and sat down with my father on his throne. So again, both being with Christ, and he being with them is mentioned. Writing to the Thessalonians about the order of the resurrection, the Apostle Paul gave the following description of what he expected to happen at Jesus' coming. Because the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a commanding call, with an archangel's voice, and with God's trumpet, and those who are dead in union with Christ will rise first. Afterward we the living who are surviving will, together with them, be caught away in clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we will always be with the Lord. But immediately we notice that Paul describes Jesus as descending from heaven. He then says the Christians then living, will meet him in the air. The Greek word rendered, air, appears seven times in the New Testament. It never means heaven, but always refers to the air or atmosphere surrounding the earth where birds fly. This is further strengthened by the fact that Paul says they will be caught away in the clouds, which is exactly how the angels told them Jesus would return. And as they were gazing into the sky, while he was on his way, suddenly two men in white garments stood beside them, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who was taken up from you into the sky will come in the same manner as you have seen him going into the sky. But does that mean that the final destiny of Christians will be to remain forever with Jesus in the sky? Commenting on these verses, the New International Commentary on the New Testament states, Indeed, everything else that may be said beyond what Paul actually says is the result of piecing together various other materials, 
since many Christians tend not to be satisfied with leaving them in the air, as it were. In fact, even though Paul speaks often and in a variety of ways about the final glory awaiting believers, there are only two passages where he explicitly locates believers' final destiny as in heaven, 2 Corinthians 5 1, certainly, and Colossians 1 5, probably. One could imply such a locational understanding from other passages, such as Philippians 3:20, our citizenship is in heaven, or the promise of our being with him, whose present location is understood to be in heaven, but these are the only two where such an understanding is expressed explicitly. The reason for this is simple. Paul has almost no interest whatever in our final eschatological geography, rather, his interest is altogether personal, having to do with their being with the Lord, whose abode is regularly expressed as in heaven. For the one whose life's motto was for me, to live is Christ, to die, is to gain Christ, location as such is basically an irrelevancy, and is mentioned only in passing when dealing with other matters. Perhaps people on all sides of the theological spectrum have something to learn from this, neither to make too much of Paul's very few references to our future location, nor to make too little of it, as though final destiny itself were something of an irrelevancy for him. His own concern is what in fact is picked up at the end of this very long sentence, and so we will be with the Lord forever. So, according to this commentary, Paul was not as concerned about location, where Christians will dwell, as he was with the fact that they will be with the Lord wherever he is. 2 Corinthians 5 1 is cited by this commentary as an example of an explicit statement that Paul believed the final destiny of Christians would be in heaven. Speaking of what sort of body Christians would have, after the resurrection, he says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, should be torn down, we are to have a building from God, a house not made with hands, everlasting in the heavens. Hence, it is quite possible that after they meet the Lord in the air, He brings them to be with Him in heaven. But the Bible indicates that it is not necessary for them to remain there. When we consider that their purpose of being with the Lord is to rule with Him, we have to ask ourselves, how will the earth experience their rulership? Will they rule remotely from heaven? Or will they actually interact with humans on earth? I believe there are two scriptures that provide an answer. You have appointed them as a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. One of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls that were full of the seven last plagues, came and said to me, Come, and I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. So he carried me away in the power of the Spirit to a great and lofty mountain, and he showed me the holy city Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Remember, after his resurrection, Jesus did not immediately return to heaven. The Bible says that he spent forty days, strengthening and encouraging his disciples. During that time he had a spiritual body that enabled him to materialize and dematerialize at will, even enabling him to appear within a room although the doors were locked. Will Christians be given this ability after their resurrection? Beloved ones, we are now children of God, but it has not yet been made manifest what we will be. We do know that when He is made manifest we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. What an exciting prospect! But for now, we are all waiting for God's kingdom to express its rulership, and for God to end wickedness and suffering on this earth. How much of this is a direct result of the activity of Satan I cannot say. But it certainly does not seem to harmonize with what you would expect of his being placed in an abyss of inactivity for a thousand years, whether that be literal or symbolic. Nor does it agree with what the Bible tells us as to how God feels about humans, to say that all of Revelation has already had its fulfillment. Although we have discussed the uncertainty as to the dating of Revelation, it is widely accepted that John wrote his Gospel, and letters, after the destruction of Jerusalem. This is significant since in his first letter, he gives clear indication that he was looking forward to Christ's coming. So now, little children, remain in union with him, 
so that when he is made manifest we may have freeness of speech, and not shrink away from him in shame at his presence. At present, I am leaning towards the conclusion that Revelation, up to the end of chapter 19, is a vision concerning the difficulties experienced by Christians at the end of God's covenant with the Jews, and the birth of the new covenant at the time of Jerusalem's destruction in 70 CE. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, you barren woman who does not give birth. Break into joyful shouting, you woman who does not have birth pains. For the children of the desolate woman are more numerous than those of her who has the husband. Now you, brothers, are children of the promise, the same as Isaac was. But just as then the one born through natural descent began persecuting the one born through spirit, so also now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Drive out the servant girl and her son, for the son of the servant girl will by no means be an heir with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are children not of a servant girl, but of the free woman. Whereas from chapter 20, through to the end, are yet for a future time. Hence, I believe John's final words in Revelation, were an indication that he expected much more to come than the end of the Jewish nation. He expresses our thoughts as well, when he says, Amen, come, Lord Jesus.